Uh, welcome back students. So, in the previous lecture we saw the hydroformylation of propene and uh, we also saw what are the hydroformylation reaction and what are the desired products which are the aldehydes. So, we have either the linear aldehydes or the branched aldehydes. So, we saw some of the conventional process for hydroformylation and we will continue with that in this lecture and we will also, also see for uh, other than propene if we want to use the precursor as higher alkenes with long alkyl chain length then how to handle those. So, starting with our lecture 4, so what we will discuss is we will see one process where a biphasic catalytic system is been adopted. So, we in the earlier process there was no biphasic system, there was a catalyst and you have a single phase, but we will take care of a biphasic catalyst system. Then uh, we will see the processes for the hydroformylation of higher alkene. Now, most of them we have discussed now is propene as the starting feedstock. So, what will be the products if a higher alkene is required or if available and can we get from higher alkene directly alcohols rather than aldehydes. So, all these processes will be discussed that is called uh, we have this process which is called the cobalt based process. So, you have the cobalt based process we have one modified one and one unmodified one. So, these the common unmodified ones are like it is called the exon process which is we will discuss and another one is the modified one which is the shell process. So, we will discuss then finally, the compare all the hydroformylation process which have been adopted by the industry till date. So, the first we start with biphasic catalyst system. Now, as I have already discussed the catalyst is the you know it is the heart of the process in the case of homogeneous solution. So, in this case a revolutionary industrial process is based on a water soluble rhodium catalyst. Okay. So, the process and the company is named as a Roshri Kemi Rhone Pionic or it is also nowadays known as Celas. So, this process uses a water soluble rhodium catalyst. It consists of a highly water soluble polar ligands, the sulfonated triphenyl phosphenamines. As the catalyst is insoluble in the organic phase. So, we are developing a catalyst which is insoluble in the organic phase, but soluble in the aqueous phase. So, you have two phases organic phase and aqueous phase. So, a biphasic reaction thus is produced. Separation is substantially simplified and rhodium losses are reduced to a minimum. So, there is no rhodium losses, the separation is simplified, but in we are talking about homogeneous, but this biphasic catalyst system makes the process as heterogeneous. So, the catalyst will be some sort, it will be of uh, I am just drawing the catalyst structure which is rhodium at the center surrounded by the ligands. So, you have the rhodium at the center. Okay. So, the structure is something like this, you have hydrogen here, then you have carbon monoxide here. Then uh, what you have is um, some connection this is the ligand, this is phosphorus at the center, then you have the aromatic ring. You have the sulf SO3 Na, okay. this is a pretty big aromatic ring. So, this I mean if I want to make it, sorry I just make it again. So, Right now, I make it in 2D so that uh, you do not uh, have any problem in understanding that. So, it is in 2D means this it is on the back side of this plane that is why I have made a figure like this and you have another ligand here. Again, a SO3 Na group been attached. Okay, then another one here. Okay, with a SO3 Na group attached. So this is the ligand. So this ligand is behind the plane of what you are seeing. So that's why I made this. But in order to make it very simplified, it means I can just put a line here so that. It does not be just behind the plane of what in in front 
behind the plane. This is that what you call the ligand, this entire part is called the ligand L. So, this L is what it is saying is the polar ligand L, this L is same as this. Now, this L is further replicated in these three direction as well, you have in this one, you have this one. So, you have a let us say you have a phosphorus here, okay. So, then uh, if I want to write this entire thing as one ligand. So, this is the ligand L. So, like this, if I want to draw this, you have one L here, one ligand here, another ligand here, okay. So, maybe you can say that this part L is same as L here, L here. So, these two are in front of the plane, L is at the back, this L is at the back. So, this is penta coordinated 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So, this is what the catalyst that has been developed by the company Rurik Rone Poling or Selassin. So, it has sulfonyl to triphenyl phosphine. So, because of this group SO3NA, it makes it soluble in water, okay. So, now we move ahead and see what the process looks like. So, now once the catalyst system is developed, then there are the process flow sheet. So, in this procedure, the reaction also occurs in a steel tank reactor like previously we have done the steel tank reactor containing the catalyst solution, okay. So, here you have the reactor, you have propene, the conditions are given here, temperature 390 Kelvin and 500 bar pressure. So, what you have is prior to entering the reactor, the syngas, the syngas means CO plus H2. Prior to entering the reactor, the syngas is passed through a stripping column to collect unreacted propene. So, now what you do is that uh, prior to entering the reactor, so before it enters the reactor, so what we do is, uh, if you see some of the propene, the syngas here, you have the syngas, the propene is one of the reactant, it is inserted directly to the reactor. Now, this thin gas is first inserted into a stripper solution where already a solution of butyraldehyde is formed. So, where already a solution of aldehyde is formed, it is passed through this aldehyde solution. So, what it is, it is stripped. So, it is cleaned off whatever products it is having. So, it should be, okay, it should be cleaned. I mean, what it happens if you do this, if you send this thin gas. So, it will also take up the unreacted propene along with it. So, whatever unreacted propene it has in this stripper, it takes away from here, again compresses it here, here and then what it happens is you have carbon monoxide, hydrogen, propene all getting together into the reactor, okay. So, uh, you should remember the syngas is passed through the stripper first, so as to take apart the unreacted propene. The unreacted propene along with the syngas is compressed and sent to the reactor. We also have propene entering into the reactor directly. So, here is the fresh propene and here is the recycled propene, okay, along with the syngas. This is the first part of the process. In the next part, so once the reaction is complete, the effluent of the liquid reactor is fed to a phase separator, where dissolved gases are removed and butyraldehydes are separated from the aqueous catalyst solution. So, what happens? So, this we discussed already, this, this is the first part that is the reactor part, the second is your phase separator. Like I, so what you have is you send the solution to the phase separator where you have some gases coming out, you may have carbon dioxide, you may have hydrogen. So, you send them outside off gases, they are sent as off gases and the remaining, the liquid part which also has this unreacted propene, this all this is sent to a stripper solution and the remaining, so ultimately what it does is it does separate the product from the catalyst basically. So, you have a liquid phase product going forward to the stripper and the catalyst coming down. So, the solid solution which is coming down. So, once it comes down, Okay, because it is uh, highly soluble in the water phase, the catalyst is soluble in the water phase. So, that is why I have written aqueous catalytic solution. So, the water along with the catalyst comes down, it will uh, give away some heat and then send back to the reactor. Okay, this is the second part. 
So, first part reactor, second part is the phase separator. After this happens, what third phase? The catalyst solution, I mean this is the same, I mean third or whatever you can say this is the third one. The catalyst solution is returned to the reactor through a heat exchanger. So, this is the heat exchanger HE, the heat exchanger that generates steam. So, you are generating steam by passing it through a heat exchanger. So, once it generates steams, then the catalyst system cycle is complete. So, this could only be possible because the rhodium catalyst, if I want to make it here, pentavalent rhodium catalyst, if you see, so if for L, 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 okay, all this L has this SO3 NA group, okay. Because of this SO3 in a group, it is water soluble. Because of this water soluble, it is easily passing into the catalytic solution. That is the biphasic system. We term this the entire the biphasic system. So, fine, this is the reaction part. Then we move ahead. So, now issue is so let me just complete. So, the catalyst solution is returned to the reactor through a heat exchanger that generates steam. So, then what happens? You have a stripper here. So, as I told you, it will recover the unreacted propene here and the remaining what it is, this is a solution of butyraldehyde and isobutyraldehyde is sent to a aldehyde distillation column. So, you apply distillation techniques, so you separate out the butyraldehyde and isobutyraldehyde. So, you get the desired product that is the butyraldehyde. This is the way you conduct a biphasic catalyst system. So, now what have we learned till now with the lower alkenes that is propene? We have learned that propene can be converted to butyraldehyde. You have what you call the oxo process. The oxo process use syngas. It reacts with propene to form aldehydes. So, in this we also saw a single phase catalyst system and then we saw a rhodium based biphasic catalyst system. So, these are the two processes. Now, what happens if your chain length of the alkene increases? Can we do a hydroformalization? Yes, because why it is required? Because higher order aldehyde is also be required. Higher order aldehyde is required for the production of detergents and plastics and precursors for many other reactions. So, initial industrial oxo process utilizes an unmodified catalyst. So, now what they did? They played around with the catalyst system. But the issue is we can do this reaction on this unmodified catalyst, but it requires high pressure and temperature to guarantee the catalyst stability. So, this is an issue. So, high pressure and temperature is required to produce the necessary aldehyde. But these are still used in the hydroformalization that is the unmodified capable catalyst. Okay. Unmodified chiral catalyst is still used for the hydroformylation of higher alkenes to make plasticizer and detergent range alcohols. This I have already discussed the detergent that is a, you have this SO3H, the aldehyde is converted to a, this aldol and the aldol is converted and reacted, it is reacted with sulfur trioxide to get attached the SO3 group attached, get acid, the acidic group which attached at the end of the aldyl, long chain aldyl uh, ring and then this reacts with sodium hydroxide and then form the sulfonated compounds which is the detergent range alcohols. So, in this processes for the long chain alkene, the cobalt recovery is vital for minimizing catalyst usage and avoiding issues in downstream processing. So, what they did the Exxon Mobil or we also this technique is known as Kuhlman technique. It offers an elegant solution to this problem of catalyst separation. So, what solution did they do? What they did? They carried out the catalyst recovery in two steps. In the first step, they reacted this catalyst after the catalyst has done its work, the reaction is complete. It will react with the sodium carbonate to form a soluble, water soluble sodium salt which is sodium carbonyl and CO4 plus water plus CO2. So, CO2 is a gas, it will just escape easily as of gas. So, it means you have a solution which is water soluble. The catalyst is modified to its form, it is converted to a separate structure which is water soluble. Now, it this reaction what it allows? It allows cobalt catalyst to be recovered using water cleaning. So, if you send this salt solution to a stripper which is containing wash water, it can take out the salt. 
So through a, then if it takes out that salt, then you react the same salt, you react the same salt with sulfuric acid. So when you react it with sulfuric acid, an aqueous solution containing cobalt is converted into an active catalyst. Again you go to that active catalyst, whatever the original catalyst was there. So you convert this sodium salt and react with sulfuric acid to form the active catalyst and sodium sulphate. So sodium sulphate is a precipitate or it is a solid, it comes down bottom and recover it, it does no use as such. So what you have is again the cobalt system and this cobalt system luckily it is soluble in the reactant which is alkene. So it mixes with the alkene and then sent back to the reactor. So that is what it is, it is soluble in alkene, it is reintroduced to the reactor, dissolved in the alkene reactor flow. So you have two steps here additional, one is you add a sodium carbonate to convert in the sodium salt which is soluble in water and then you strip off the water and then add sulfuric acid to convert it back to the active catalyst. And this active catalyst is soluble in alkene, you mix them and then send back to the reactor. So, so two steps are additional, it is required. So this was actually proposed and conceptualized and finally industrially it is applicable for the exon process. So this is the exon process. So you see there are uh, number of columns has increased. So here in the initial part, the alkene, recycled alkene, makeup catalyst and syngas. So there are four parts, alkene, recycled alkenes, makeup catalyst and syngas, the CO plus H2 are fed together to the hydroformylation reactor in a steel tank or a loop reactor simultaneously. Now you see there are lots of arrows, so what are these arrows comprised of? See here is the complex, the catalyst complex, this is the catalyst complex. Catalyst complex entering here and this alkenes plus the catalyst complex which is a regenerated catalyst complex. So I should write here, should not be regenerated or recovered, you can say recovered whatever it is, regenerated or recovered catalyst plus alkenes because I told you this catalyst is soluble in alkene. So it is brought with that otherwise it is a solid solution. So you bring this, mix it with the original catalyst and the alkene as the raw material. Now when you have this alkene, you take a part of this alkene and send it to the catalyst absorber because it is this last step where you mix it with the recovered catalyst which is HCO, CO4 and send it back to the reactor, okay. This is the first step. After passing through the flash vessel, this is obviously uh, is one of the process, you pass the entire contents through the flash vessel. So the flash vessel, it will separate the liquid and the vapor part. So the vapor part, you see it is coming out here on the top, here it goes here and sends as a cough gas. So what can be the off gas? It may be carbon dioxide, it may be hydrogen, whatever. So this goes away. So what are you having? A liquid phase. A liquid phase is then sent to a cobalt removal unit. So cobalt unit recovery unit, what it does? It gets treated with a stream of aqueous sodium carbonate. So aqueous sodium carbonate is sent here, okay. Now while we send the off gases, some of the syn gas will also escape. So that syn gas, some part is actually sent to the reactor. So this is two parts, one is the off gas, you have a filter here, other than the syn gas, you throw everything outside, the remaining everything is sent outside. So you get the unreacted syn gas back to the reactor. Then you have a cobalt removal unit where you react the solution, which is this solution has, uh, you know, this although the aldehydes present. So this cobalt will only react with this sodium carbonate and it forms NaCO, CO4. Next step, what to do in the next step? The cobalt complex forms a sodium salt that is water soluble. After water scrubbing, so you are here, this is the water scrubbing. So this was step 1, this was step 2, this is a reaction. So when the reaction occurs, you have this sodium salt of the catalyst, okay. So this sodium salt of the catalyst here, again it is 
separate it out in a wash column you have you will be some uh, gases will be evolved in this reaction so because co2 is also one of the product so co2 is separated from the off gas the remaining solution is sent back to this so ultimately what you get is nsco co4 for coming from outside when you strip it so what if you strip the nsco if you strip the catalytic medium so what are you remaining with you are only remaining with the products so what are the products products are aldehydes because your aldehyde is already formed in this so you have the aldehyde and the catalyst together so the aldehyde will not be soluble in water it will come out and see i have written here the crude oil is then sent to distillation so i have not shown here the distillation columns it is sent or hydrogenation so if you do a hydrogenation you can get direct alcohol and if you do a distillation you can separate out the aldehydes based on their chain length okay so here the cobalt complex forms a so organic phase you remember it's a crude aldehyde so in this you have the organic phase and the aqueous phase organic phase is so organic phase and aqueous phase so organic phase is only aldehydes okay you should remember this aldehydes while our aqueous phase is the catalyst system because the catalyst is soluble in the aqueous phase okay so this is what you should remember once you go ahead what you do is you regenerate the catalyst so it is we go ahead and we go to the so what you do you add sulfuric acid from the top and send the sodium carbonate salt soluble in water to the regenerator where acid is present so just what i was discussing the crude aldehydes if you see here they are transported for distillation and the surplus alkenes are recovered and returned to the reactor for recycling so now what it is this is a surplus alkenes so prior to that you have this sulfuric acid getting added and the sulfuric acid reacts with the catalyst that is sodium nacoco4 to form the original catalyst that is hcoco4 and sodium sulfate the sodium sulfate comes out as it is and the remaining hcco4 goes to the catalyst absorber unit where the catalyst is reacted or not reacted it is absorbed with the alkenes because it is soluble in the raw material alkenes and sent back to the reactor so that's what i have written in the regenerator sulfuric acid is used to convert the sodium salt into the original cobalt complex the alkene feedstock is extracted and recycled back to the reactor okay so now this is was the high pressure your pressure was very required very high in the temperature and pressure both required were high so there was a concern that if such high pressure and temperature can we modify the catalyst and low use a low pressure can we do that okay. so they did some research and can we do it directly to alcohol instead of aldehydes can we do it directly to alcohol can we convert the propene sorry not propene the higher level alkenes directly to alcohol so what the shell did was they developed a technique which is again based on the similar ligand the trialkyl phosphine cobalt not similar on the lines of the phosphine based ligand trialkyl phosphine cobalt catalyst because i cannot i don't know the structure of this cobalt catalyst due to proprietary information so this trialkyl phosphine cobalt catalyst that is more stable than the unmodified catalyst that is hcco4 permitting operation at lower pressure so if it is more stable so it can be easily used for carrying out hydroformylation so the method yields alcohol rather than aldehyde which is advantageous because alcohols are the intended by products or the intended products actually not the by products that is the products so can we just pull off or lower down the inventory we can we go away with one step the only issue is with this process is there is a increase chance of hydrogenation so alkenes may get converted to alkenes so the generation of alkene is possible so alkene generation is possible that is 15% against 2% so with this catalyst it's fine you can go ahead its catalyst is stable low pressure but you have a chance of producing 15% alkene as against 2% for unmodified catalyst so what shell proposed it is desired to use two reaction stages so they used two reaction stages 
in which the first reaction stage has a lower hydrogen partial pressure. So, in this means you send syn gas, but hydrogen deficient syn gas in the first reactor and the second reactor the opposite, you send hydrogen rich syn gas. Okay. So, why the lower hydrogen partial pressure is sent means lower hydrogen uh, deficient, so that you do not have this hydrogenation reaction. So, you should not convert the alkene to alkanes. So, it is enabling the reactor to encourage hydroformylation rather than the hydrogenation of the alkene. So, it is desirable as we saw hydrogenation of the alkene. So, this is the process. So, now you see you have two reactors in series, one reactor, second reactor. In the first reactor you have hydrogen deficient, in second reactor hydrogen rich. Okay. Now, let me explain the remaining flow sheet. So, the alkene feed is introduced to the first reactor along with the complex consisting of makeup and recycling catalyst. Okay. Alkene is here, you have the recycled alkene and you have the catalyst, fresh catalyst and the makeup catalyst all coming together and entering the reactor. So, now to assure the hydrogenation of the aldehyde into alcohol, a hydrogen rich gas is introduced to the second reactor. It means here you have the hydroformylation occurring, the pressures are around 70 bar which is less than the previous one. So, here what you do is you convert it directly to alcohol because now all of them are calibrated to aldehydes. Now, aldehydes means CHO group has been attached. In this case, you have this CHO group getting attached. Once the CHO group gets attached, now you increase hydrogen then alcohol will be present. Okay. So, it will be converted, CHO gets converted to OH alcohol in this process. So, there are these two reactors are worked with this simultaneously. The separation thereafter is accomplished by depressurizing a flash vessel followed by distillation. So, this flash vessel what it does? It will recover the byproduct gases, care should be taken, it rejects the CO2 and other gases but not alkene. So, alkene is again taken apart, compressed and sent back to the reactor as a recycled feed. Okay. Then what it will? It will send the entire solution which has the alcohols or aldehyde, I mean, the, the reaction may not be complete in totality, it is sent back to the distillation. So, in the distillation first column, the unconverted alkenes are extracted. So, now distillation the unconverted alkenes are extracted and returned to the reactor for recycling. So, you see the unconverted alkenes are returned to the reactor for recycling. A purge stream is introduced to prevent the accumulation of alkenes. So now, issue is if you do not uh, take out alkene and if there are alkene formation, so it means the alkenes if it is not regulated, it may produce more and more alkene. So, ultimately the reaction rate will drop. So, what you do? You leave out some alkene. So, even if so that at any time the alkene production even if it forms it should not be at a higher level. So, it should not interfere with the reaction. So, that is the reason some amount is purged. It is purged out. Then what happens? The second column is used to remove the catalyst complex. So, once all the solution has been prepared that is the alcohol and aldehyde is sent to the second column. So, the second column is used to remove the catalyst complex and heavy byproducts. What is this heavy byproducts? These heavy byproducts are dimers of aldehydes. Uh, for example, the aldol, suppose it is the formation of aldol, we have already discussed in the previous lecture how the aldols are formed. So, those are heavy ends. So, again this some of the heavy ends is perched and some of the heavy ends are mixed with the recovered catalyst that is carbonyl and the phosphine complex and sent back to the reactor along with the fresh catalyst which is sent as a reactant feed. Okay. So, when you do a distillation, the easiest thing is you can easily use a traditional distillation to separate out the catalyst and the crude alcohols, that is the advantage. So, the dimerization of aldehydes generates byproducts, the accumulation of the aldols is avoided by purging a portion of the recycling stream. So, this aldol should not be there together in the reaction mixture. So, you put it 
heavy ends, you purge it, so these are aldols, you purge a part of the stream and send the remaining along with the catalyst back to the reactor, this is how it works. So what are the key points, some advantage disadvantage of this low pressure process, the process is simpler than the Kuhlman, it is simpler than the Kuhlman hydroformylation process, however it has two distinct disadvantages, what are the disadvantages? Thorough purification of the syngas is essential, you should send in pure syngas. So if you send in pure syngas, because if it is not pure, the ligand is extremely sensitive to oxidation, the ligand may be oxidized, if the ligand is oxidized, you may be catalyst losses will be there, so that is what you should have pure syngas sent to the reactor. The activity of the modified cobalt catalyst is significantly lower than that of the unmodified catalyst. So, activity is less, even the catalyst they have prepared in that manner so that you can conduct both the hydrogenation as well as the aldehyde to alcohol direct, uh, I mean conversion of alkene to alcohol directly, catalyst you have prepared, but the problem is the economics. What is the economics? For the same productivity, when I talk about same productivity, I, it implies the rate of reaction. For the same rate of reaction, reactors must be 5 to 6 times larger than in the traditional process. Because if you remember the catalytic activity is in the, in the numerator in the rate reaction, so if it is in the numerator, so obviously the catalytic activity is less, so it means you require more or larger volume reactors in the transition. These are the two disadvantages, fine. So now the benefits, what are the benefits? These are disadvantages 1 and 2. The benefits include a higher linearity, so the branched aldehyde will be very less. So whatever alcohol or aldehyde is produced to this, mainly it is alcohols produced, aldehydes produce is very less, the alcohol will be linear chain alcohols, that is the biggest advantage, because linear chain alcohol only you require and its ability to extract the catalyst from the product using the traditional distillation. So please recollect in the previous slide, the last column, you just simply apply a distillation unit. The distillation unit means you separate out the alcohols from the catalyst solution. That is what the ease of the process is all about with the shell process. So moving ahead, so if I want to compare all the processes which we have studied in the last two lectures, in the previous lecture we studied the rhodium and the phosphine based ligand, okay. Today we saw the rhodium and phosphine but water soluble, this is the biphasic catalyst we have just seen, this is the biphasic one in the start of the lecture. And this was the previous lecture, the rhodium based catalyst, this is the carbonyl compound, so this is co cobalt based catalyst, unmodified, this is the modified, so this is unmodified. And this is the modified. unmodified and modified, fine. So now let us see the first process conditions, pressure and temperature. Say it is 20 bar, but you have this branched alkenes, aldehyde also possible. Then uh, the pressure increases 50, 270 and the temperature is higher in case of the modified person. But look at these two, alkene and this product. So what type of feed it can take? The rhodium phosphine based only terminal, those which are having terminal C3, C4 alkenes, same with this biphasic, it cannot take long chain propene, it can take all types of alkenes, okay, all types of internal alkenes. Internal means it can also take the alkenes where the double bond is present in between the chain. So it can, both of them is in that case it is advantageous. Then product, it will only form aldehyde, the biphasic will only form aldehyde. But in this, one unmodified, there is a formation of aldehyde, but you are forming a long chain aldehyde. And in the shell process, this is the shell process, this is the exon mobile process, shell process, you have mostly the cetan alcohol. Cetan alcohol is very useful for detergents as I told you. So this is one advantage, biggest advantage. Now linearity of the product. So linearity, it is highly linear, 7 to 95, this is biphasic is the good, but both these processes are limited, it can be only used for that propene. Then the unmodified is 60 to 80, 
and modified is 70 to 90. So, more or less the linearity percentage is lesser in the case of unmodified and modified as compared to the traditional processes which are using propene as the raw material. Then alkane, how much alkane is produced? See, the conventional process does not produce any alkane because hydrogenation is not at all possible with those catalysts. The alkane possibility is highest in shell and then a bit lower in the unmodified version which is the Exxon mobile process. Metal deposition, no, no for the propene, but it is having a problem with both unmodified and modified cobalt catalyst. Heavy ends, very little in the propene, uh, the rhodium based or the biphasic catalyst, but if you know cobalt for both modified and unmodified, there is a heavy end product that is heavy end is primarily the dimers of aldehydes, aldols. Then the poison sensitivity. The poisoning of the catalyst is very high in the propene, very high in the conventional that is you have the rhodium or the biphasic catalyst, the catalyst may reactivate very quickly or poison very quickly, but this is very chance is very low in the case of unmodified or modified cobalt based catalyst. Relative metal cost, well you have the rhodium metal here in the both the propene, you have rhodium, so rhodium can be easily be very expensive, so they that is why this cobalt is useful. So, if I want to draw it in a point it in a scale of 1 to 100, 1000. So, if it is 1000 times less expensive as compared to rhodium. Then ligand cost because these are phosphine and some are the stretch chain. So, ligand cost for the phosphine waste are very high in the case of shell. It is low in the case of the unmodified version, but it is pretty high when you have the phosphine based ligand in rhodium. So, ligand cost is more and the companies which does so for the rhodium based catalyst, you have the union carbide for propene and the rhodiumic for Rone Polic, okay. So, that is the your process, this is called Celes company, then Exxon Mobil for unmodified and then for the modified version, you have the shell. So, this is all about the processes, different catalyst medium and I have already discussed the catalyst structure. So, I will stop here. So, you should go through this textbook reference and then uh, you should also see this article where the rhodiumic rhone polyac oxo process, the biphasic catalyst is discussed in detail with the reaction mechanism. And the third one, you will get both these methods that is, this is the exedropedia where you will get this oxo process for higher alkenes. So, I suppose you get hold of these uh, references and follow this, then you will understand the aldehyde formation processes. Thank you.